This is camp week. Many of our young people and uh, some of the adults are going to camp and some will yet be going out, I believe, this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who are visitors, we welcome you and appreciate you very much and we're glad you're here. Uh, if we could encourage you to take a visitor card from the queue in front of you and fill it out and uh, just hand it to me or someone else in the foyer for me to leave this morning, that would be appreciated. Uh, also, I'd like for you to take notice of the insert in the bulletin if you have not done that. And if you are interested in a class this fall, then please sign that and hand it to myself or to Barbara and let us know then about that. Whenever I preach on marriage, I realize that some think, well, I'm being left out. But I can assure you that marriage in a society like ours is going to affect everybody and has or will sometime. And when a society becomes corrupt and sinful, so does the practices concerning marriage. Uh, it was true just before the flood of Noah, as we uh, were so ably read in our scripture reading, and it will be true at the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, if you know what's going on with marriage in our country today, you know that as an institution, it is in serious trouble in our society. I could run through all the stats. I could talk about no-fault divorce, and cohabitating couples, and unwed mothers, and teenage pregnancies, and the near disappearance of the nuclear family and the physical and sexual abuse and child abuse and, and on and on I could go, but you know about all this. You don't have to have me to tell you about all this. You already know the problems. Many families have experienced or know someone who has affected because of these things that are going on in our society and has affected the lives of husbands and wives and children and grandchildren and parents and grandparents and, yes, even great-grandparents because, you know, they have suffered the joy and the sorrow and the good and the evil and the happiness and unhappiness of all the things that are going on in our society as a result of all this. Marriage and home is the basic unit of civilization, not only in our society, but in everywhere in the world. And therefore, what happens to that has a great effect on the society's welfare anywhere in the world. As our culture becomes more and more paganistic, some are beginning to call this the post-Christian society. I hope it never turns out to be that. But many sociologists and legislatures and legislators and religious leaders uh, are ignoring the fact that God has definite laws and institutions concerning marriage and expectations. Some of the current attitudes in society are even hostile toward marriage and the home, and some would like to just, a few, or the more radical, would like to just eradicate it completely. Others would like to reduce it to little more than a legal contract for legal and financial purposes, and that's what's being done a lot in our society today with the movement that I'm going to talk about next. As if the heterosexual community hadn't done enough to damage marriage, then the latest destructive battle concerning marriage is the homosexual, or as I believe the current uh, political term is same-sex marriage, politically correct term. And let me just say that the whole concept of same-sex marriage is an oxymoron. It is against nature. It is against everything that God has ever laid out. And for the legislatures and judges and religious leaders and others who support it, we'll just take oxy off the beginning of that. After the Supreme Court decision to strike down DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, which was a federal law, and uh, to uh, take down Proposition 8, which was the California law that prohibited same-sex marriage, 
the battle is going to turn to the courts and to the states. And it is going to be a battle that's going to last for quite some time into our future. While the Episcopal Church, lead, with the Episcopal Church leading the way, I should say, and some of the more liberal denominations accepting all of this into their membership and even into their leadership uh, positions, it's, it's trying to be made acceptable to our society. And while we were certainly teaching the truth concerning this issue, the homosexual movement and their supporters insert ACLU here and the liberal media and many celebrities and on and on we could go, made it a civil rights issue. Not a religious issue, but a civil rights issue, and they have won battle after battle in that way. So by making same-sex marriage a civil rights issue in a growing uh, ungodly society, you say, why do you say that? Well, the nunners, which is a new term, maybe you're not familiar with. The nunner is the people who, who uh, claim no religious affiliation has reached 25% in our society right now. And uh, these and others, according to the polls, if you read the polls, have uh, managed to make same-sex marriage acceptable to over 50% of the population, if you can believe the polls. That's something I have to say. So this is where we are. The question is, what do we do in such an environment that hopefully would get better but can get much worse? What do we do? What is expected of us? We are still citizens of a great country, and there are still ten righteous people, I believe, in the country that will keep us from getting destroyed. But we are also citizens of a greater kingdom, an eternal kingdom, and one that has its own laws and its own principles concerning marriage and morality, and that's what we need to be living for. If we want our marriages to be successful, we need to recognize that God has laws, that he has instructions, that he has reasons for doing what he's done, laws that he's given, and certain expectations in his kingdom concerning these things. So a marriage is successful when it produces the opportunity, the atmosphere, and the training for parents and children to enter heaven. To help us work toward being successful in our marriages and in our society, I will explore the origin, definition, and purpose of marriage under three questions. And by the way, when I counsel people uh, that I'm going to marry, I deal in all of these things these situations I'm going to deal with you here with this morning. First of all, what is the origin of marriage? Well, marriage originated in the mind of God in the beginning, in the creation. In Genesis 2.18, it said, Then the Lord said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Nothing was found in the creation up to that point, and so a helper suitable for the man was made and he brought forth the woman. It was God who created them and brought forth the first man and the first woman and established this social order of marriage which still stands. Because marriage originated in heaven, God has given spiritual laws in order to govern and regulate marriage for our good, for our purposes. Governments that make laws that usually treat marriage like mankind invented it and do whatever they would like to do with it. Thus, the homosexual movement in our society today. Humanists and organic evolutionists really do believe that they had, we invented God, that people invented God, and that uh, wrote the laws for God, and therefore they believe we did invent marriage. Let me tell you something. Left to our own devices, without God, the human race would never have thought of anything as blessed and as sacred as marriage and the laws that govern it in the Holy Scriptures. They would never have come up with it. Whatever people believe or whatever law society makes does not change God's law. 
they will remain the same, and if they are broken, then people will pay socially, and they will also pay spiritually. Neither is marriage an institution or a sacrament of the church. God instituted marriage thousands of years before he ever established his church on this earth. And God has regulated marriage with different laws and, and different periods for different reasons throughout the biblical, the biblical history. Old Testament Jewish law was not the same as New Testament Christian law. Some of the Old Testament laws had to do with land inheritance. In fact, whenever you uh, have people coming to Jesus while he was here on this earth in Mark 12, 19, and they said, uh, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man, uh, man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother shall take his wife and raise up offspring to his brother. And yes, that was in the law of Moses. It's not in the new covenant. There is no such law in the New Covenant. So we in Christ's church should look to the New Testament and God's law of marriage and never to church rules or church laws, as some might do. So marriage originated in the mind of God. And secondly, I want to ask, what is the definition of marriage? First, let me give you a scriptural definition. The scriptures say that marriage is when two become one. And after God had created Adam and Eve as a suitable helper for him, he said to Adam, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. When a man and wife becomes one flesh, they also become one in purpose and reason for living here on this earth. When a man and his wife become one in the physical relationship, it should not be shared with any other person on the face of this earth. God intended marriage to be permanent whenever the people were coming to Jesus uh, with the divorce issue in Matthew 19 and verse 3. Some of the Pharisees came testing him and said, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife when he calls it off? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now there might become a reason for separation of a marriage, but it has to be because of what God said and not some rule that we have made out. Marriage is a covenant relationship between a man and a woman and God and is not to be taken lightly. The, the Jews in Malachi's day were having a great deal of trouble in their society also concerning marriage and concerning their worship. In Malachi 2.13 it says, And this is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering uh, or accepts it with favor from your hand. He wasn't accepting the worship. And he said, Yet you say, For what reason? They were questioning. Why aren't you born? He said, Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So it's about two things here, worship and treacherous dealing in marriage and covenant. Let me try an all-inclusive definition uh, of marriage from the general teaching of Scripture. Uh, marriage is an agreement by which a man and a woman consent to live together as husband and wife for the purpose of establishing a home, mutually accepting all the responsibilities that the relationship involves and properly expecting all the rights and privileges do each other. That's just kind of an overall picture. Marriage involves the responsibility of wisely using the rights and privileges that go with marriage. Marriage is not for immature people. I don't care what age you are, it's not for immature people, really. Marriage could be defined in another way as, as an application of the golden rule to a very uh, personal and intimate relationship. Therefore, whatever you want people to, or therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat 
then, Matthew 7, verse 12. One of the keys to understanding marriage is that it is a partnership. It is a, a relationship of togetherness. And ours is uh, one of the key words in marriage. Uh, things belong to not you and me, but us, our income, our home, our children, our Bible classes, our worship, and so on. All of these are important in that relationship. And before you marry, make sure, and I'm saying this to the men, before you marry, make sure that uh, you love the woman you're going to marry as much as you love yourself. And make sure you love yourself also. That's important. In Ephesians 5, 28, so, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see that she respect her husband. When you put those two things in marriage, you put love and respect in there together, and you've got a winning combination that's going to take you a long way. In fact, I believe if you keep it there, it'll take you all the way to the end. Marriage and selfishness cannot be practiced together with any amount of success. Well, let's look at the third aspect of this quickly. What are the purposes of marriage? Why did God bring it you know, instigate marriage to begin with. One purpose, of course, is the procreation of the race. Uh, it was necessary in the beginning because there was nobody on the earth, and whenever God uh, created Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 27, 28, since that God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We've pretty much accomplished that, maybe a little too better, uh, too much. Uh, marriage and procreation is still necessary, though. You, know, you stop it for a generation, and you, you know, that's the end of the race. But marriage and procreation are necessary for other things, too, uh, for the leadership of the church, for one thing that Jesus established here on this earth. Uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 3, 2, an, an overseer, it says, must be beyond reproach, the husband of one wife. And in verses 4 and 5, he says he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? So the church is called the family of God. We are a family together. Therefore, the elder must know how to oversee a large family. He can't oversee his small family. How can he oversee a large family is what he's saying. Well, that's one reason for marriage is procreation of the race. The second reason is to provide companionship. And this is an extremely important part of marriage. And as you get older and grow older in a marriage, you begin to understand that more and more. You must enjoy your wife and your husband's company as well as love them. You should enjoy being together, uh, talking and planning and having fun together and doing the things that people do in life. Genesis 2.18 said, Then the Lord said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so it's not suitable for the man, he said, to be alone. And so companionship makes, uh, is really that which comes into play here. Marriage is first and foremost a social relationship. Two people living together. And marriage that, that begins to be built only on the physical relationship has not a very good chance of surviving unless love then takes hold somewhere, takes root somewhere in that relationship along the way. And that companionship becomes important. And 
you know, we, we live in a society where it seems like uh, marriage is built on the essential relationship and uh, if it doesn't change, if that's what it's built on, it's probably not going to last very long, and many of them don't. Dating is the first step toward marriage for the young people. And it's where unmarried people, in fact, both young and old, should learn to develop a mature social relationship, know how to live together in harmony with one another, and the other will just naturally come to take place as it should. Well, a third reason for marriage is to prevent immorality. Uh, we find the scripture is very plain on this in the first Corinthian letter, chapter 7, verse 2. It says, but because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise the wife to a husband. The wife who does not have authority uh, excuse me, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and likewise also the husband does not, does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The proverb writer said that a man when he marries a woman, should be intoxicated with her, with his wife's love. In Proverbs 5, 18 to 20, he said, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving kind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy to you at all times, be exhilarated always with her love. Why? For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? Desire is not condemned in the Bible at all. Illicit desire outside of marriage, outside of that relationship, is condemned. In Hebrews 13 and verse 4, it says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Procreation is not the only reason for the marital relationship. So the scriptures do not teach that birth control is either prohibited or that it's a sin. Well, let me look at the last reason I'm going to talk to you about today for the purpose of marriage, and it is to provide a home, a sanctuary, a spiritual training ground for children. The home should prepare children for a successful life here and in eternity. The home can't do that without successful parents, or at least one successful parent. Now, sometimes I've seen where there was almost total failure in a home and somebody outside the home took the child and developed the child. But that's rare. So it falls on the parents. In Proverbs 22, that probably overused verse says, train up a child the way that he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from. I could expound on that a little more, but, but I want to share with you just kind of a little formula I ran across that shows the influence of the home on children. A child from birth through high school spends about 105,000 hours awake in their life. That was before cell phones, I think. I'm not sure about that. Uh, they spend about 88,000 hours under the direct or indirect influence or supervision of the home. And they spend nearly 15,000 hours in school from grade 1 through 12. And if sent or taken to Bible class weekly, they spend about 2,100 hours uh, in, under the influence the, of uh, those who might teach them there. And you would be thinking, well, what does all this mean? Well, it means that a child spends seven times more under home influence than under school influence. And it means that the one who attends Bible class regularly still spends about 50 times more time under the influence of the home than under the, the Bible class teacher or the preacher or the youth minister. What it really means is that parents are responsible for their children's success or failure far more than the school or the church. And that's really what it comes down to. 
but I know and I've seen that some children can manage to fail all of their own, no matter how much effort and how much time and how much influence the parents try to put into their raising them. They'll manage to get out there and fail on their own. And I've seen it happen, and I know it happens in a lot of families. And I can see it happening sometimes, even in my own extended family. So it is a battle with the world that we're involved in, in all of this relationship of parents and children and so forth. But let me draw this conclusion. Marriage serves as an example of how we relate to Christ through the church. And what I was reading there in the Ephesian letter has a lot to do with that. In Ephesians 5.23, says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. And in verse 25, says, husbands love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. And let me just draw a conclusion here. If Christ is the Savior of the body, he's talking about the church here, then it's pretty important that uh, he's going to present the church to himself, as it also said here, it's pretty important that we be a part of that church that Christ is going to save and he's going to present to himself. Because that's what the saved is. The church of the saved are the same people. And when we are baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, the Lord adds us to his church. Acts 2.38, Acts 2.41, and Acts 2.47. Those that were being saved were added on a daily basis or when they were saved. So if you've never been baptized into Christ and never done the things surrounding baptism that is necessary for salvation, then there's no better time than now. If you know what that is, if you don't know what it is, then there's someone here that will certainly sit down and just open up the scriptures and say, here's what it says and show you what God calls on you to do. So there's no better time to do that than now if you know what to do and you haven't done that. And if you've done that but you've not remained faithful to the Lord's kingdom, then there's no better time than now to repent and say, I want to reinstate my citizenship in the Lord's kingdom and do what God wants me to do. Let me encourage you to do whatever it is necessary for you to get to heaven. I'll just stand and sing to encourage you at this time.